name. We are going to go tonight back to what we talked about a little bit um, last Wednesday. Remember we talked about how people would be deceived uh -huh. and why were they deceived if you remember was because as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 because they received not the love of the truth that they may be saved. Now, how many of you uh, can say like I know I can say very easily, people told me the truth and there were things about life and things about history, things about science, whatever it may be, things about me or for you it would have been things about you and you would say, yeah, that's true. Anybody ever tell you the way you came off was terrible and you went, yeah, that's true. Amen. But you didn't love the truth. Amen. Right. You heard it, you swallowed it, but you didn't really love it. And no matter what we're talking about, in all this walk with Jesus, our walk with the Father, uh, you know, knowing the Lord, saving grace, they were going to be deceived because they didn't love the truth. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about tonight about really loving the Lord, loving God. We're not duty bound. We're in a love relationship with our Father, a love relationship with Christ who set us free. Uh, and remember the Bible says faith works by love. You remember that? And that love covers a multitude of sin. Amen. So in all of this, Everything we say and do, it's, it's got to be because of the love of Christ, because of the love of God is in us. And you'll probably remember many times where when we've been in praise and worship, I've said, listen, tell the Lord you love him. Amen. Because a lot of people don't do that. In fact, one of these days we're going to have a husbands tell your wife you love her and wives tell your husband you love him. And a lot of you aren't going to show up for church that day, I'm sure. But, or will you? You folks will show up? Okay. You can say it. It's like when you used to say to your children when they were little, say, I'm sorry. Say you're sorry. And they weren't going to say those words. And sometimes I think we're like that. Maybe I'm presumptuous about that. Uh, I try to praise and worship and say, Lord, I love you. Uh, you know, because I know where I was. Amen. I know some of the things that I've seen in my life in the past that I've seen other people be crippled by. And I mean crippled emotionally or personality-wise or, you know, just, hey, sort of, chuck all of that stuff i'm not going to be a part of this anymore so in all that we base what we do in the love of the lord so just a couple of scriptures tonight and may not be long i'm not worried about that whatsoever but they would be deceived by this man of sin because they don't love the truth and we know that jesus is the truth right Amen. The word of God is truth. These are the precepts and the principles <clears throat> that God ordained, excuse me, <clears throat> God ordained and laid out before us. It's how he created the heavens and the earth. It's how he holds all these things in place. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 And I guess we could say every time we come to church or every time we pick up our Bible uh, and we read or any time we say to the Lord in prayer, like, Lord, is there something wrong? Am I missing something? Am I, you know, maybe out of kilter here? Am I being blindsided by something I didn't see? In doing that, in the love of the Lord, we know he's not going to hurt us. He loves us more than we could ever love him and Amen. loves us more than anybody else could ever love us. So uh, we know that he does things to correct us and build us and help us and bring us to that place like the Bible says 
that we're being conformed into the image of Christ, that we're going to be that part of the bride in the end without spot or wrinkle or blemish and so on, uh, so that we're pleasing to the Lord. So Deuteronomy 6.5, you know this from past times and all your reading and everything in the commandments also. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. You see, he doesn't say serve the Lord. Amen. He doesn't say be duty bound to the Lord. Or, you know, so many times we were at a meeting this morning having a conversation about somebody who has some issue and, you know, do they feel guilty if they don't? Do they feel driven if they don't? Uh, do they feel like something terrible is going to happen to them if they don't? And of course, the Bible is very clear that God wants us to obey. We'll read that scripture too and do the things we're supposed to, but he wants us to do it because we love him, not because I have to and that whole mindset over again. I think we need to be reminded of that often. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And again here, we talked about this in the Greek, the word heart in many places meant the seat of our decision making. And it's what it implies here. It's not the physical heart, you know, and it's not that um, emotional heart. It's the seat of our decision making. Because you may have loved your wife or so on before you married her uh, because of emotional type love but then when you got married to her now you're in a commitment it's a little bit different but now you teach yourself sometimes to love and you uh, sort of prepare your heart your decision making because you love you do things because you love her now not just emotionally but because there's a commitment, and that's where we're all at in Christ. So to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And you know, when we talk about spiritual warfare, and you think about loving God with all your might, sometimes you may have to fight to stay in that love. Amen. Right? Yeah. Just like sometimes in marriage situations and relationships with family and children you have to fight what's going on right now to love them you have to fight your feelings fight your emotions sometimes fight anger fight disgust heartbreak you got to fight all these things with all your might so that you can continue to love them and we're talking about god our father who's a good God, a good Father, and who loves us with a totally pure love and never says or does anything to try to hurt us or anger us, but as I said, to prepare us, to mold us and shape us into what he has determined for his creation. So then if we look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, and this is, again, uh, for so many folks, and a lot of the things happening in churches right now because maybe they've gotten their eyes off the Lord and they're getting their eyes on people and situations and things, which we can all do at times. And <clears throat> so they're not really maintaining what the Lord said. But look what it says here. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. But now he shows us there's more to this. And this is the thing in a lot of the teaching and ministry and instruction. Listen, you can't leave people at the place of just believe because along with our believing comes what he says here. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge. Now we have to know what God has charged us to do as one of his sons or daughters, Amen. as one of his people. Amen. What is the charge he gives us along with us saying we love the Lord? 
So he says, therefore thou shalt love the Lord in Deuteronomy 11.1 1, and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. That means till the end. So he's showing us that we're to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our um, might. But now he's saying in loving me, it means we keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments. And it's really uh, just like when you have children and now they're of the age where you can start to show them that there are things required so you give them chores that they have to do. And you do this not for the couple bucks I'm going to give you, but because you're part of our family and you need to learn some responsibility. And wouldn't it be great if they did it because they loved us? Uh, now let me reverse that. Wouldn't it have been great if you did it for your parents because you loved them? And in all that, it becomes so much easier. It's not a task anymore. When your wife gets up, you know, at 9 o'clock at night, she fell asleep for a few minutes and gets up and says, Honey, I want ice cream bars or, you know, I want a milkshake. Or, and we've done this one, we've run out of coffee. And in the morning, so we run to Dunkin' Donuts and get coffee in the morning, which doesn't happen very often, but it's happened. So normally you would be sitting around maybe watching you know, the early news or reading your Bible or whatever. But yeah, we got a situation. So you get up and you go get some coffee. And then it's always because it's for you too, right? Amen. So love the Lord your God and keep his charge. And so a charge for all of us is read your Bible and pray, you know, spend time with the Father. Uh, then we get into the statutes, the judgments, the commandments, the things he's ordained for us to do, and always being mindful that he put regulations out here. We call them judgments, commandments, statutes. He put sort of rules out here, like I talked about a few weeks back, like fences so that we won't get hurt. A fence in front of a cliff. Now, a fence by the highways. Why are all the highways lined with fences? Because they don't want people, animals, things running across the highway. They're there to keep you safe Amen. from accidents. I hope that's still why they do it. But that's why they did it, so that you wouldn't have to worry about driving down the highway and a child runs out in front of you when you're doing 70 miles an hour. So, or people, or whatever the case. And of course, it also marks a boundary. We own this ground. You don't own it. So when you're cutting your <coughs> ditch, or you, know, you decide to make a go-kart track or whatever, you stay on your side of the fence. Amen. So we're to keep those and keep those always. So in loving the Lord, which Nowadays, uh, again, having a conversation about we need to explain what we mean about some of the things we say. The old one that I've used so many times when somebody says, well, God made us free to be free. What in the world does that mean? Does that mean I can do anything now? Of course not. It doesn't really say we're free to be totally free because when you're totally free, you have no restrictions whatsoever. You do whatever you please, whatever comes to mind. And God hasn't given us that or allowed that to be our case. We're free. And again, I years ago said, you go back to Moses. When the Bible has areas where you see the first occurrence, many times you've got to follow that all the way through the scripture. So when God first set his people free, Moses went to Pharaoh, set my people free that they may serve me, not just to go play in the desert, not to go party in the desert. 
It was to go out and sacrifice to the Lord and serve God. And so in all of this, you take that principle of first occurrence and you follow these things through the scripture. So we're way back here in that, remember that thing called the Old Testament way back there that only the Jewish people kept? <laughs> and a lot of the churches, are, I'm sorry to say, don't want to go back to these things because they say that. That was for the Jews, it's not for us. And yes, the legal things of the ceremonial laws and so on, that was for the Jewish people. Did we just talk about Timothy and Titus, I think, last week or so? One was circumcised and the other wasn't because one was of a Jewish lineage as serving the Lord and the other one wasn't. And so there was a delineation there about circumcision doesn't save us, but as a Jewish child and keeping in that order, he was circumcised. So, uh, love the Lord thy God, keep his charge and his statute and his judgments and his commandments. And you can read so many places here where the Lord charged us, if you will do these things, I will bless you. I will prosper you. I will take care of you. I will cause you to be uh, above and not beneath in Deuteronomy and some of these places. Uh, I'll cause things to go well with you. Uh, all these things, these are charges the Lord gives us like you would say to your parents, your, excuse me, as parents would say to your children, if you will just do what I say, here's what we'll do. Here's where, where we'll go. Here's what I'll provide for you and so on. Just do what I say. And sometimes that is the hardest thing to get done. Amen. But that love relationship. So then you, you're very mindful, like Leviticus 19.18 says, He's talking about loving your neighbor here. He says, you shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. And I think a lot of times we say neighbor, we mean anybody, but of the Jewish people, he meant of your brethren. And then, you know, of course you were honest and upright with those others and so on, but they weren't the ones he was specifically talking about. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. In other words, any of the, for us, we would say any of the saints. I don't know if that causes anybody to think like, gee, do I have a grudge against somebody that really is a part of the body of Christ, one of the saints? Uh, do I um, want to avenge myself with them? He says, not to avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So when you are grilling out and you've got prime rib on that grill, then you should give some to your neighbor because you're to love them like you love yourself. Amen. And what it really means is don't mistreat your neighbor, your, your brethren, and so on. Treat him as though you would like to be treated, which we know later we read where Jesus said about do unto others. So he says, don't bear any grudge against your people, against the people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then we know Jesus talked about and made clarity about loving the Lord and loving your neighbor as yourself on these two principles hang all of the law and the prophets. They're all fulfilled in that. But look how he says in the end of that, he says, uh, I am the Lord. In other words, he wants us to know who said it. He wants us to know that it's coming from me, and so it's truth. It's going to produce life. It's going to cause you to do well in the earth. I am the Lord. I wrote here in my notes, Yes, it's me. In other words, God's saying, do you, do you understand who's saying this? Where this is coming from? It's not whoever you heard it from. It's me. So uh, let's go to Isaiah 58. And just a couple of verses here. Isaiah 58. 
You remember what Isaiah 58 is. It's the part of the scripture where he says, uh, if you remember a book, this goes back 25 years or so, God's chosen fast. Isaiah 58 is where God says to Israel, is this the fast that I have chosen that you would what bow your head like a bulrush and so on. Um, and he said, you fast for strife and various things and you're basically fasting for stuff you want. And he says, that's not the, the fast I've ordained. My fast is that you, uh, you, know, you dole out your bread to the poor and so on and so forth. But in verse 12 of Isaiah 58, he talks about those who fast and do in a right way. He says, they shall be of thee, or they that be of thee shall build the old waste places which, of course, we see in Jerusalem and in Israel, everything being rebuilt and restored, and the Lord has blessed all that's there. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Raising up a good, strong foundation. And listen, that's what we got to keep praying for these younger folks. That's why it's good to be involved with some of these organizations that deal with the children and you may not understand or think much of it, but even with that little four-hour window we have with some of those children at the Kids Fest, uh, they're getting some gospel. They're getting some moral uh, structure and some basic of creation. And that's why I asked the folks that helped us there under the tent, I want you to do Genesis 1. Find something, portray something, you know, get across to those young people. And I don't know, I think I told my wife this, but it was neat to see some of the children run up to the teacher afterward and hug them. Amen. Like they got something out of it. And again, the very fact that some of the children, you, you heard them answering questions from biblical things, just like the old thing of why couldn't you make something manifest? I talked about this Sunday in your hand because I'm not God. And that's great that these young kids, and they were maybe 10 or 12 years old at the most, they understand that. Or at least they were being reminded of it. And they've heard that before somewhere. Amen. So he says, you'll build up or raise up the foundation of many generations. So we need to pray for godly people that deal with uh, that which will be another generation. And we've tried to invest in that in as many areas as we can and so on, and try to have a hand in it. Um, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. So, you know, people's lives, a breach is a break in a wall. Or you could have a bridge. If it has a breach in the middle, you can't cross over. Um, so he says, you'll be called the repairer of the breach. In other words, now people can walk over from this life in the world to a life with Christ. That's the greatest breach that we can repair in people's lives. Showing them the truth. Teaching them to love the truth like we read about those who would be deceived in the end here so that they won't be deceived. So you'll, be the, uh, ra you'll raise up the foundations of many generations... And, you know, I, I know I pray this. I hope you do, too, and probably you have. But, Lord, I want a godly lineage of where I'm from. If I'm the first one, of course, I can't really say that. There was one. My mother was born again, but that was after me. Uh, but a godly lineage, in other words, my sons and daughters to know the Lord and them to teach their children to know the Lord and to be involved in the work of God and be, as, as we talk about here, love the Lord with all your heart because in that, God will take care of you. He'll be your father. So you'll raise up the foundation of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. Isn't it great when somebody comes back to you and says, you know what, I'm so glad you talked to me because I was going the wrong way and all of a sudden, Things have changed. Amen. Because you showed me Christ or you 
ministered Christ to me, ministered the gospel to me. My life has been changed, and so I'm thankful. He says, if you turn your foot, in verse 13, from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. Now, turning your foot, it says from the Sabbath, but he's talking about you abstain from doing your own pleasures on my holy day. I talked about a while back a place in, I think it was New Jersey, where they still totally kept the Sabbath day Everything in the city shut down. We all remember that from our younger days. It was what the blue light law, I think it was called. Everything was closed. So there was nobody to compete with on Sunday for business. There was nobody working the factories on Sunday because it was honoring the Lord. And here's what we're looking at in some of this. Our country has gone so far from that. Uh, The sports arenas have overrun this thing. Yes, there were sports back in the time of Jesus. There were the, the Greek, the uh, athlon, uh, what's that word? There was the Olympians and so on, triathlons, all those type of things. That was all going back in Jesus' day. It was all going on because, remember, we talked about uh, circumcision for a Greek kid would be like a mutilation of his body because they were in the bod beautiful. Uh, where are we today? Why are we using plastic and all kinds of other things and hair implants and all this other stuff? Why did we start doing all this? Because that's what consumes us, how we look, how we appear to other people. Uh, that's why I said when we started doing this online, and if anybody's out there listening, There's no makeup here. There's no hair dye. There's lights and whatever, and you can see everything. There's no cover-up. There's no facade. It's all real. (laughs) Uh, Because we're not perfect. If you look at me, you'll see one ear is lower than my other ear, and uh, my nose is a little off to one side the way it goes. I'm not afraid of that. I mean, if somebody gets, I'm married, so I don't have nothing to worry about with that anyway, right? If you all say, well, I'm married, and who cares at this point? I mean, I'm not going to make myself go the other way or, you know, run my face into a wall. But if she accepted me the way I am, I don't need anybody else to, you know, qualify me, I guess, or I don't need to qualify for anybody else, right? But that's where everything's gone. So this community up there, They kept the Sabbath, and per capita, they were the wealthiest community in the United States. And now you're talking about places, and they pay high taxes up there, up on the East Coast. But they were still the wealthiest community. Now, this was about eight years ago. I don't know, maybe nine years ago. I don't know if it's still the same. But think about that. If they did it as an honor to the Lord and loving God, I would say God was taking care of them. You know, they may not be perfect. They may not even be right about some stuff. But God honored that. Just like he honors the Jewish people in the sense of they still have a covenant with him. Yes, they need to come to saving grace through Jesus because he said we're all under sin, both Jew and Gentile. And Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, which was the priesthood God had given the Jewish people to restore it and in that he is the repairer of the breach because there was a breach between them and their God because of so many of the things that had happened in life so he says that um, if you'll turn your foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day so what he's saying is instead of being at the football field on the Sabbath day turn your foot And get yourself to Sabbath, which we would say is the gathering together of the saints. Many people will say that's church, uh, which is us gathered together, although we're the church. And, you know, the I forget what 
denomination it is when you go by their buildings. I just saw one down in Columbiana last night. It says, this is where the congregation meets. It wouldn't be like we name it the church at Warren. We are the church at Warren, us people. Amen. And this is where the church at Warren meets. And we've always tried to maintain that mindset anyway, although we take care of what we have. So, turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. And it's, every one of us can question our own hearts here, and check our own hearts. Am I so glad to get out of church? Am I so glad to, or am I, you know, hesitant about getting there on time and, you know, the preparation and praying before I come? I mean, is it really something, because it says here that if we call the Sabbath a delight, in other words, I delight to get prepared. I delight to be there. I delight to say, listen, whenever it is, that's when it is. Uh, I don't plan anything else. Because this is what I delight in, the Sabbath. So turn your foot from thy, uh, doing thine own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. Now, the word delight here has a few meanings, but love is one of them. If you love ice cream, you're delighted when you get to the ice cream store. Especially if it's homemade ice cream. It's not Dairy Queen. Well, Dairy Queen, I shouldn't say that. It's not some fake ice cream thing. Not that Dairy Queen is. You love real ice cream. It's a delight to you. You love maybe sitting at the lake watching the birds come in and the water and the smooth water and everything else, and it's relaxing and calming. It's a delight. You can prop your feet up there and sit for a while. Forget about some of the things that are going on in life. You love that. And that's what he's saying here. Don't do your pleasure on my holy day. Call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord. Do you remember that we're blessed because we come together and honor the Lord? We take that time to serve him. Do we remember that that's what he said? Uh, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together, right? Back there in the Psalms. He commands a blessing. So many of you may say, I don't even know why these things happen for me. But it's because some of these things you keep. And we'll talk about a little bit more in Isaiah 56, what he says about that. Because he blesses us. He sees what the seat of our decision making is, our heart. When people say he sees my heart. He knows my heart. He knows when we do these things uh, for the right motives. When we, and it might be a struggle. You may have a bad week. You may have hard times. But you know what? And it may be a little tough coming in to gather together with the saints. It may be tough even entering into praise and worship because you're fighting these fights and battles all the time. But remember what it said up there, to love him with all thy might. Listen, we're here to praise. God's in the midst of us, the Bible says, because we've gathered together. I'm going to overcome how I feel. I'm going to overcome some of the horrific things I'm going through right now. And I'm going to praise him in the midst of it. Amen. Because I love him more than I love myself. Amen. And I could sit in this thing, stew in it or whatever, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, and with my might, because I can in Christ. So if we call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, a delight, holy, honorable, the gathering together of the saints, it's honorable in the eyes of the Lord. It used to be honorable in our nations, that changed somewhat, as I talked about Sunday morning. In fact, I think last Sunday we talked about Jacob and how Laban's countenance had fallen toward him. Do you remember? And I said that the world's countenance toward the church has fallen toward us. 
It's not like it used to be. But we've got to maintain the same love and the same relationship. We've got to maintain that the Sabbath, the gathering together of the saints, is a delight, not a burden. I got to get myself together. I got to go. You know, I really, I could, how many people will say, I could just sit home and listen to it because it's so much more convenient. But that's not a proper attitude before the Lord. Amen. So a delight, holy. There's a holiness in this gathering together, and we should all maintain keeping that holiness. And uh, in the sense of talk about our proper dress, most of us, we don't have to worry about that, but if we have younger people and new people and people that don't know that we we welcome them the way they are we accept them the way they are and down the road a while we start mentoring them in the sense of listen you know now you've been around you need to this a little bit you need to that uh, i think i said that uh, i posted that little uh, thing about uh, cleavage in the church and a lady said something back on the, the idea of, well, when I go to church, I expect people to pray for me, not pray on me. Well, I understand what she means, but listen, we have to teach people how to dress, how to come when they approach the house of God. And we've talked about that many times, and most of us have no problem whatsoever uh, in those areas. But people who don't know and don't understand, of course they're going to come the way they are and they don't have the reverence or the respect for the Lord in those areas and then as they grow they should gain some of that and they should hear that in the teaching in the preaching it's not legalism it's not brow beating or demanding but it's like come on just like you say to your children after a while you know or husbands and wives after a while there should be a respect between the two of you that wasn't there in the beginning because your love has grown and you won't do certain things and I'm having a thought right now that I'm not going to speak <laughs> with your spouse things that you don't you know you, you respect them so you kind of keep a reserve even in that Amen. because you love them so call it a delight call it holy of the Lord call it honorable uh, and it says and thou and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words so in all of that you know what he's saying if i tell you it's a four letter word and we used it a little bit ago i think maybe last week it's in matthew in the beginning there in about the first five or six chapters or verses chapters um, we talked about it a little bit. Four-letter word. Amen. What's he saying here? Listen. Honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. What did Jesus say you have to do to follow him? deny yourself right god said that in the old testament and jesus repeated it in the new just that jesus used the word deny it says here not doing your own ways deny yourself nor finding thine own pleasure deny yourself nor speaking your own words deny yourself then Shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. How can we delight ourselves in the Lord? By denying ourselves. It's not about my words. It's not about my pleasures. Right? That's what he said here. And it's not about my own ways. In Isaiah, what is it, 56, I think, the uh, one part of it, I think that's where it's at, where it talks about, 
my ways are far above your ways, my thoughts above your thoughts, and so on, right? You all remember that? So he's saying it's the themes of the scripture are interwoven all through the scripture. It's always the same. Yes, we may look at something and say it seems to contradict, but if we go back to the, as I said, the original use, we usually will find the original use is built a little more and a little more as we go through. Just like Jesus saying that if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Amen. Where in the past, you had to go to the physical activity or you related it only to the physical activity. So you add and build all the way through, not add to the word, but you add to the understanding of what he says all the way through. But he said, if you do this, so if you deny yourself, deny your own ways, your own pleasure, and your own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. That sounds like a blessing, right? We may not quite understand that part. And then he says, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, which is the blessing of Israel, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What did he say up earlier? I am the Lord. Yeah, it's me. Here he says, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, that you'll be blessed, that he will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, and then um, you'll ride on the high places of the earth. So now go to Isaiah 56, verse 1 and 2. It says, Thus saith the Lord, we talked about being diligent a couple of weeks ago, we talked about continuing. Amen. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice. Now this is way before Christ came. And he said, For my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Remember, the priesthood, the Jewish people, and so on, they were doing their own righteousness. Amen. And he said, I'm going to reveal my righteousness. My salvation is near to come. Remember, Jesus then would say about the kingdom is nigh thee. The kingdom is at hand. So my salvation is near to come, which... The Bible tells us that suddenly he will appear in his temple in Malachi. My salvation is near to come. My righteousness, my righteousness to be revealed. You see, a lot of times people have tried to save themselves, but he's saying here's where my righteousness or my salvation is going to come, which the blood of Jesus, the death on the cross, something that the religious order of the Jewish people couldn't accept or couldn't see it's God's salvation. His salvation isn't the way man makes it out to be. And his righteousness is greater than the righteousness of men. As he says here, my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed. Anybody want to be blessed or blessed? Blessed is the man that doeth this. And the son of man that layeth hold on it, take a grip of it. Remember when you take hold of the plow, he says you're not to let go, you're not to go back. That the man that goes back isn't worthy of the kingdom. He says lay hold of this, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. You know, in, in all reality, when you have both your hands on the plow, you can't do much else with your hands anyway. 
Remember, we talked about the plow about a month ago, about when you take your hand off the plow, suddenly it hits a rock, it bumps up out of the ground, and you've got to get it started again. I watched uh, an Amish fellow, and he was plowing a garden, and he had two big workhorses in the plow, and then he naturally the, he's standing behind it. And I'll bet that garden wasn't 50 feet long and maybe 50 feet wide. And so he would put that plow down in the ground and talk to that horse, and that horse would go, and you'd watch. He was holding it down as hard as he could because he only had a short distance to get the work done in. And then he would pop it up at the end and get the horses to turn around, and it was kind of neat because he'd get them to, like, jockey themselves around so that he, because he had to keep them in a short area. And then he'd get the plow back down there in the ground again, They'd start walking again, whoa, and the horses would stop. He'd pop the plow, plow up out of the ground, and then at the end, he went back across the opposite way at each end to get that part of the soil that he missed, and he never took his hands off the plow because even when it wasn't in the ground, he was controlling the horse's movements with it. It's pretty, you're not amazed by that, I can tell. <laughs> You need to go to Amish country and watch for a while. Amen. That's right. Amen. So he said, blessed is the man that doeth this. Listen, talking about the Sabbath, talking about loving the Lord, talking about loving your neighbor as yourself, all these things, keeping this Sabbath, keeping that love relationship, loving God, loving his people, loving the Sabbath, the gathering together of the saints, all these things. He says, blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it. Gosh, you guys, if you understand it, which I know you have, you've been here for years, a lot of you, and I'm thankful I understand it, that means we laid hold on it. Amen. We got a grip on it. And all I'm saying now is, listen, hold fast. Remember Revelation, so that no man takes your crown. Don't let go of the plow now. Don't get back into, you know, my own pleasures and my own words and, you know, uh, my own ways. Don't get back into that. Don't let that trap snap shut on you. I don't know if any of you saw this little video clip they put out where, you know how the mouse gets caught in the mouse trap? Well, this mouse got caught on his back. Usually they go head first. And so it shows him doing push-ups with the, the snapper there of the mouse cage. If we looked at life that way, you'd never have nothing beating you down on the back of your neck. Take whatever comes in, at you and work out with it. This is a workout. Fiery darts of the enemy, quenching them, catching them, quenching them. You know, the enemy lays a trap for you. Well, this is more opportunity for me to exercise my jumping ability. The hinds feet that the Bible talks about in the scripture. All these things. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it. Now, I know this isn't pertaining exactly to where I said it's, we've taken a portion of the scripture. But in reality, this theme is all through the scripture and everything we do. Everything the Lord gives us. Blessed, and the Son of Man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it. And sometimes fighting to not pollute something, like even you may have water or a well at your house or whatever, you're always paying attention to the color of the water, right? The smell of the water. Sometimes you can taste the oil in the water. You don't want your water to get polluted. And so it's not just one thing that comes at us. There's many facets of what we have to watch in all of this. Amen. That, keep, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Amen. Amen. And many of us know we did plenty of that kind of stuff in the world. We don't want to do it anymore because... We found the love of the Lord and come to love the Lord uh, more than we love ourselves and more than we love some of the things we possibly could have 
if we just let go for a while. But thanks be to God that there is a Holy Spirit here. And he's here to remind us. And he's here to convict us of unrighteousness. And before we commit unrighteousness, and the Lord has revealed his righteousness to us, right, through Christ Jesus, that we have on that breastplate of righteousness. The Bible says Christ is our righteousness, so we can rejoice and be glad in what the Lord has done for us. So the Lord tells us basically all the time how he loves us, all through the scripture. He told Israel how he loved them. But even in that, they still fell in sin. And many of us have fallen at times in sin, although we know the Lord loves us. But his love hasn't waned for us. And that's why it's good to just keep us clean slate. And again, you know, the fellowship of the saints. And be reminded all the time when you come to church, when you gather together as the saints, that you know what? This is the old thing of sandpaper rubbing together sometime. Uh, pray for the churches. There's churches that have issues going on. We may not have anything festering that we see right now, but a lot of other folks do, and we can pray for all of them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us tonight, and if you've listened in and maybe you're new uh, or you're locally around us here, if you'd like to come to church, we start... 1045 on Sunday mornings and 645 on Wednesday night. And we're just people that follow Jesus, believe in the Lord. We're not a denomination or any of those type of things. We love the Lord. We try to stick as close as we can to what the Bible says. We do preach and teach that you must be born again uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the only way into the kingdom because he's the one who died for our sins and paid the price for our lives and so it's through him that we're saved and he is God in the flesh when he was here in the earth he was God in the flesh that came to reconcile us or bring us back to or fi fix the breach that was between us and God so that we could make it into the kingdom of heaven in the end and live a good life in this world in the process so we'd love to see you in church love to have you here with us but if you can't make it here Make sure you accept Jesus into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and be your Lord and Savior and apply this Bible to your life. And this Bible is life-changing. The Bible says it's the power of God to all of us who will believe. It's the power of salvation. And you can have that in your life too. God bless.